peace, love, science. Here we are, I think. I'm going to just assume that we actually are here. I mean, maybe we're not here. Maybe we're somewhere else. But wherever we go, there we are, right? Hi, Bonnie. <laughs> well, Bonnie's here, and I'm here, and that means Lauren's probably here, so I think, I think it's a party. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's start off with our uh, Funky Science Story Hour theme song. How do we get here? What's inside your squishy little head? What's bluer than blue? What's redder than red? Gather around my people, all children young and old. Pull up a seat, put up your feet for the greatest story. For joining me happy happy Wednesday and uh, good afternoon to those of you in the eastern US of Earth good evening to those of you in Europe good midday to those of you in California Good morning, Australia. Good morning, Vietnam. And to those of you watching from Mars, I can only say, <laughs> and I'm sorry if my pronunciation was not very good. I'm still working on my Martian. Um, this may look like a lava lamp, 
just an ordinary lava lamp like your parents or maybe your grandparents had in their college dormitory. And they would sit there looking at it and going, oh, wow, man. Oh, wow, look at those blobs going up and down. Oh, those blobs are hitting each other. Oh, this is groovy. If you don't understand why your parents and your grandparents did that in their college dormitory with this thing called a lava lamp, I can't completely explain that to you. It's not really a question of science, but you're going to have to get them to explain it to you. But um, anyways, if you've never seen it before, seen one before, this is a lava lamp. And um, it's, uh, as Carmel says so astutely here, it's totally cool and blobby. Um, and I have it here partly just because I like it and it's funky. And this is, after all, the Funky Science Story Hour. By the way, hello, I'm David Grinspoon, your host. Some people call me Dr. G. Some people call me Dr. Funky Spoon. Some people call me the Space Cowboy. <whistles> Not really very many people call me that. Um, but, um, but you can call me that if you want. Anyways, um, so this is the Funky Science Story Hour, and so we're going to talk about science, but we're going to do it in a, a, a slightly funky manner. And um, the reason we have this lava lamp here is because it's not, despite the fact that it looks like an ordinary lava lamp of the kind that your parents, or, or maybe your grandparents, had in their dorm room, <laughs> um, this is actually... A planetary convection simulator. And this is something we can use to talk about what's going on inside, deep inside the Earth. And not just deep inside the Earth. We can, talk, we can use this planetary convection simulator lava lamp to talk about what's going on inside the sun and what's going on inside Jupiter. And not only that, we can use it to talk about what's going on in the atmosphere, the weather. All of these things have to do with something called convection. So I want to talk to you for a few minutes now about something cool called convection. You can see it happening here. You see there's some blobs going up and some blobs going down. What is causing these blobs in this planetary convection simulator lava lamp to go up and to go down? Why are they doing that? Why aren't they just sitting there blobbing like blobs would do if, I don't know, why, why, are, they, why are the blobs going up and down? That's what we really, really want to get at here. Well, it has to do with some things we've been talking about already if you've been watching Funky Science Story Hour, it has to do with the way matter responds to heat. Now, what do I mean by matter? Matter is just everything. It's all the stuff. It's what you're made out of. It's what this chair I'm sitting on. It's what everything is made out of. It's, it's everything is made out of atoms and molecules. The, uh, so I, I almost could say everything is matter, but it's not because there's also energy, right? Like the light coming through this room. We've talked about light uh, and other kinds of radiation. That's energy, which is not matter. But all the stuff in the universe, all the solid and gas and liquid uh, and even the plasma that the sun is made of, that's all matter, okay? Now... One quality of matter is its temperature. And you know about temperature. You feel hot. You go outside in the sun, you feel hot. Or uh, you open the refrigerator and you feel the air and you feel cold. Or you go outside in the, in the winter and you feel cold. You know what temperature is. But what really is temperature when we're talking about matter? Do you ever think about that? Like if I... Um, pick up uh, 
a, a potato and I go, oh, it's hot, Whew. and I put it down, and then there's another potato, and it looks just the same, and I pick it up, and I go, oh, this one's not hot. What's really the difference between the hot one and the cold one? Well, we can describe that with science, and what temperature is, it's a, me it's a measure of the, the vibration going on inside that object. So if you've got um, anything, say a rock, um, and it's sort of cold, then the atoms in that rock are sitting next to each other, and they're always vibrating. Everything, all matter, it's all the atoms are always vibrating a little bit. And in a cold, say a cold rock or a cold blob of lava, anything, the matter's just kind of sitting there and this everything's vibrating a little bit and the neighbor atom is here and they're vibrating next to each other and they're just kind of like vibrating a little bit and that's something that's cold but if you heat something up what's changing inside of it if you heat up something that's solid what's changing inside of it is that those vibrations get more intense more energetic so instead of just sitting there like that now the atoms are going like this next to each other and they're crashing into each other. I described it last week as like a mosh pit, you know, like people dancing. And if the music is, you know, just kind of like, mm -hmm, they're sitting there. But if then, then the music gets really intense and they can't help it, they want to get up and move. And they're like, oh, like, wow, this is amazing. And they're crashing into each other. That's like the atoms. When you heat something up, the atoms are moving more inside that thing and they're vibrating and they're crashing into each other. And that's true for a solid, and then we talked about the difference between a solid and a liquid, right? Is when the atoms come loose and they're not just stuck next to each other. And in a solid, the atoms or the molecules are just vibrating stuck next to each other. But if it, if it gets so hot that they become unstuck and they're sliding all over the place and they're not stuck next to each other anymore, then that's a liquid. But either way, if it's a solid or a liquid, or even a gas, when the atoms are just flying, you know, flying all around the room, it's still true that the hotter something is, the more motion there is in the atoms, okay? So a cold, a cold object, the atoms are just kind of sitting there. They're always vibrating. Anything, everything has a little bit of, we call this thermal energy. All matter has a little bit of what we call thermal energy. And that just means that the atoms are vibrating. I'm an atom, I'm in matter, I'm vibrating. And then, if you heat it up, they're vibrating and they're moving a lot more. Whoa, I'm, I'm inside a hot rock now. I'm really vibrating a lot. Okay? Now, the important thing for understanding what's going on here in the planetary convection simulator lava lamp is that when you heat something up, it expands. It gets bigger. It fills up more space. It takes up more room. The reason for that is because of those vibrations I was just talking about. Think about it. If you've got um, anything, say a piece, a little piece of metal or a rock, and the atoms are just sitting there because it's cold and they're just vibrating a little bit, and then you heat it up, and so the atoms are crashing around and vibrating a lot. Then the, because they're bouncing into each other, they want to take up more space. And when you heat something up, it, it gets bigger, it expands. It's a tiny amount, so you usually can't see it very easily. But, um, but you can measure it. Scientists can measure it in a laboratory. But this is very important for understanding convection. When you heat something up, it expands. Okay, now, that means also that it becomes less dense. That is, if you've got a certain amount, a certain volume, let's say a cubic foot of something, let's say rock or metal, it doesn't matter, really anything. You've got one cubic foot of that thing and you've got it at a certain temperature. And then you heat it up. 
it's going to expand to be a little bit bigger so that one cubic foot of that same stuff when it's hot is going to weigh less. Okay, so you heat things up and they don't weigh as much in the same amount, the same, what we say, the same volume, the same amount of it weighs less. So this is why, for example, let me give you an example you've seen before. Think of a hot air balloon. Now you think you can picture that you've got a balloon and there's a basket down below and the people get in the basket and they want to go up in the air. So what do you do? You turn on a flame below that balloon and you fill up that balloon with hot air. Now, why does that hot air balloon rise? It's air inside, just like it's air outside the balloon, but it rises because the air inside the balloon is hot. And because it's hot, it's expanded more than the air outside the balloon, which means it's less dense. It makes it buoyant. It wants to rise above the other air. Okay, so anything that you heat up is going to want to rise up because you heat it, it expands, it gets less dense. That means it, we say it makes it buoyant. It wants to rise up. Okay, so that is why a hot air balloon rises. Now, I want to talk about the inside of the earth. We talked last time, there was a question about why is there, um, why is there lava in volcanoes? And we talked about what volcanoes are. And I said a little bit about this, but I didn't really say. I said there are places in the earth, inside the earth, where there's hot material rising and melting to make volcanoes. But what is it inside the earth that's making hot stuff rise to the surface to create volcanoes? Well, inside a planet, it's always very hot. The deeper you go, the hotter it is. And this has to do with something else we talked about last time, that rocks themselves put off heat because of what we call radioactive decay. There's a little, every, every kind of rock, there's a little bit of, um, we call uh, atoms, elements, we call um, uranium and potassium. Every rock has a little bit of these elements that are just um, decaying and putting off heat naturally. And so if you have a planet a big planet like the Earth, 8,000 miles across, you get deep enough and that heat is building up inside. So planets are hot on the inside. Now, they're hot enough so that some of that matter wants to rise up. And that's what we call convection, where you have rising plumes of hot rock that are coming up to the surface. And then when they get near the surface, they're losing heat. They're losing heat either because it comes out in a volcano or just getting near the surface. It just, it cools off and radiates out into space. So you've got hot, you've got cooler rock up top and hotter rock underneath. And if it's hot enough, it's going to be expanded compared to the other rock. And you're going to have plumes of that hot rock rising up. And then as it cools off, it's less dense and it's going to sink down towards the center of the earth and other places. And then as it gets more towards the center of the earth, it's going to heat up again. And when it heats up, it's going to get less dense and rise up. So the hot rocks are rising up because they're, they're buoyant, they're less dense. And then as they cool off, they're getting more dense and they're going to settle down. It, you can see this, by the way, if you go to your, the kitchen and you heat up something, a can of soup or some spaghetti sauce or whatever, and you turn on the stove and you watch, it'll start, it'll start burbling and going blah, 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 blah. It's convecting. That's convection, the hot stuff rising and the cool stuff sinking. And just as it's happening in this very groovy and very funky lava lamp right here, it's the same thing inside the earth that is churning around, 
causing volcanoes, sometimes causing earthquakes. It's the motion inside the earth. Now, here's a weird thing, though. Here's a weird thing about the inside of the earth is that it's not liquid. It's churning like this and blobbing like this, but it's not liquid. It's squishy solid. Like, think about like butter, okay? When you take it out of the fridge and it gets warm enough so that it's squishy and you can spread it on a piece of bread, but it's not liquid, it's just squishy solid. That's what the inside of the earth is like. Little bits of it melt and that's when you get volcanoes and things. But most of it, we call it the mantle of the earth. Okay, the earth has, um, let me go to the magic, uh, magic screen here. If this is the earth, it has a core. Make that a little bit bigger. And the core of the earth is made out of metal. It's iron with some nickel and a little bit of other stuff, but mostly iron. And part of the core is liquid and part of it is solid. But most of the earth is what we call the mantle. I'll put that in a different color. Most of the earth is this part, what we call the mantle. And then the very outer part of the earth Sometimes we call it the crust, but really a better word in this picture is we call it the lithosphere. Lithosphere. Lith means rock. Litho means rock and sphere means round. This is, and that outer part of the earth is solid rock. Like what you're familiar with when you think of rock. It's hard and it's brittle and you hit it with a hammer and it'll smash. But most of the earth is this, what we call the mantle. It's deeper inside, it's hotter, and it's solid, it's mostly solid rock, but because it's hot, it's squishy like butter. And this is where the convection, like the lava lamp is happening, where there's blobs of hot rock coming up towards the surface, and then other places where hot rock is sinking towards the center, and other places where it's coming up towards the surface and other places where it's sinking towards the center. And that motion inside the earth is called convection. And that convection is what drives a lot of the movements, a lot of the geology we see on the earth, the earthquakes, the volcanoes, all these other things that make earth such a dynamic and vibrant and you know, a living planet. I mean, I don't mean living like life. It has that too. But I just mean moving and animated. It's because it's hot on the inside and it's convecting like the lava lamp. Now, here's something else cool. Convection is what we're talking about. And convection is what makes the motions inside the earth because of the heat coming from the center of the earth. But convection is also important in the atmosphere. Let's draw the atmosphere of Earth here. Now, this is not, we say this is not to scale, meaning the sizes are all off. Like if this were really the size of the Earth, the atmosphere would be this thin. You could barely see it. And then we wouldn't be able to see the diagram I'm making. So I'm making a, a fake cartoon Earth with an exaggerated atmosphere, a bigger atmosphere than you would really see. But here's what's cool is that there's convection happening inside the air, too. In fact, that's what makes the weather. So if you've got the sun, let's say the sun over here, shining down on the earth, that means it's going to heat up the day side of the earth, and it's not going to be heating the night side. And that, so that's going to move around as the earth spins, where it's getting heated. But that means that part of the surface of the earth is always hotter than other parts of the surface of the earth. And that causes convection in the air so that you have currents of air where it's hot that are rising up and other places where the air is sinking down because it's cooler. And this is complicated. There's motions all over the atmosphere because the air is all churning around and it's spinning and it's mushing around. And that's why the weather 
is so complicated, but it's driven by the temperature differences because the sun is heating up part of the surface of the earth and that's causing air to rise in places and sink in other places. And that convection is what causes the weather because then you have things like if you have moisture in the atmosphere and it rises up, then at a certain altitude, it gets cold enough so that that moisture, that water vapor, it gets cold enough. What happens to water vapor when it gets cold? It turns liquid, right? It condenses. And that's what makes clouds. So when you have rising air convecting into the sky and it gets to a certain level where it's cold enough, then you get clouds. So it's this convection that also makes clouds and other things. And it causes all the, all the weather on Earth. So it's the same kind of physics that's moving things now, inside the Earth, it's really slow because the rock is, um, we say it's viscous, which just means that it's, uh, you know, the motion, it takes a long time to move it. It's not, it doesn't flow very easily, this hot rock. It takes a long time to flow. So the motions inside the Earth are really slow, and the motions inside the atmosphere are really fast, like the weather. But it's the same thing, convection. And it's also the same thing inside the sun, uh, it's the same thing inside of other planets. It's one of these beautiful things that we learn about through science that connects all these different, all these different phenomena, all these different uh, things that are moving and changing in nature. And that's why I love my groovy lava lamp. I mean, it's just a fun thing to have, but it also happens to be a planetary convection simulation lava lamp. So, so there. Um, that was why I wanted to uh, show you this lava lamp. Now we're gonna we'll come back to uh, we'll come back to uh, talking about convection more because it's one of those things that connects um, so much in the universe. Keon, who's ten years old from New York City, wants to know about sublimation solid to gas. That's cool. That's cool. I'm glad you asked, Keon, um, because it fits in with a lot of the things we've been talking about. When matter is cold, really cold, of course, it's ice, right? And then we talked about why when you heat it up, it goes from being a solid to a liquid. And that is because uh, the atoms are vibrating in place. And when it gets hot enough, they cannot stay vibrating in place. They just cannot contain themselves. And they start sliding all around the container that they're in. And that's when something melts and goes from being a solid to a, a liquid, right? And then what happens when you heat up that liquid and you heat it up and you heat it up? Then those atoms or molecules that are sliding around all around in the liquid, they start flying around even faster and they get so excited they can't even stay in the container anymore and they start flying all around the room and bouncing off the walls or whatever that's we call that boiling right so you've got um you go from solid and you melt and you and you go and that melting a solid turns it into a liquid and then boiling that liquid turns it into a gas Right, so that's those are what we call phase transitions. Water is ice, and you melt it, and it becomes a liquid, just liquid water, and then you boil it, and it becomes a vapor, a gas. And it's all the same water molecules, right? H two O. We talked about that before, right? The um, the uh, big oxygen with the two little hydrogens at a funny angle. That's a water molecule, right? And it's all the same, whether they're vibrating in place in a solid or whether they're sliding around in that container as a liquid or whether they're zipping all around the room and bouncing off the walls as a gas. So we'd say we go from a solid, we melt to a liquid, and then we boil to a gas. <clears throat> but there's something that can happen sometimes, which is called sublimation, where it's almost like the ice cheats and it goes straight to being a gas. It doesn't go through, in some conditions, you can have the ice, just be, you heat up the ice and it won't become liquid, it will become a gas. 
And that we call that sublimation when it goes right from being an ice to being a gas and it doesn't stop at the liquid phase in between. Now, why does that happen? It'll happen when there's very, very low pressure, when there's not much gas in a room or in an atmosphere on a planet. If you've got ice on the surface of a planet that has almost no atmosphere, almost no atmospheric pressure, like let's say Mars, we talked about Mars. Mars has very, very little gas, very little atmospheric pressure, almost like only um, 1% or 1 one hundredth of the pressure on the surface of Mars compared to Earth. So, so the surface pressure of Mars is like the, the pressure on Earth if you went way up in the atmosphere in an airplane. And in those conditions where there's not much gas, where there's no air pressure, then if you heat up a solid, it will not become a liquid. It will just become a gas. So in fact, if you have if you have an ice cube on the surface, if you have an ice cube on the surface of the earth and you put it out in the sun, it's going to melt into a puddle of water, right? And then you leave it out in the sun and that puddle of water is going to boil or it's going to vaporize and evaporate, right? And become vapor. But if you have that same, get this, if you have that same ice cube and you put it on the surface of Mars and you put it out in the sun and you heat it up, it's not going to melt into a puddle of water ever. It's just going to vaporize and become steam or become become water vapor, become a gas. Now, why is that? It's because if you think of that ice cube, say on Earth, um, and those molecules in that solid and they're bouncing around and they're getting more and more energetic and they get to the point where they want to stop being in that crystal and float all around. Why don't they become a gas? Why do they become a liquid first on Earth? It's because the air pressure is pushing down on that surface and pushing down on that container. So let's say I have a glass here. Okay, there's really coffee in here. But let's pretend it's ice and I melted it. Why does the water stay in that cup and not just float all around in the room like vapor? It's because there's a lot of air pressure in this room because we're on Earth. And I'm glad there's that air pressure because that's what that allows us to breathe. We need that air pressure to stay alive. And we don't really, we're not aware of it. You don't think about it because it's, it's like the air we breathe. It is the air we breathe. It's just, it's always there. So you don't, you're not aware of it. You don't think about it. But it's the air pressure pushing down on the surface of that water that keeps it there as a liquid. And it has to get more energetic before the, the, um, the, the motion of those molecules can push against that air pressure and escape out into the room and then it vaporizes. So that's why on Earth, you melt ice and it will become liquid first. And then it has to get more energetic in those molecules before it become a, can become a vapor. But if you're on a planet like Mars where there's almost no air and you have this glass of ice and you heat it up, then basically once those molecules get enough energy in them, in that ice, so that they're going to break free of that crystal, then there's no air pressure holding them down to stay a liquid and they're just going to float off into the air. And we call that sublimation. So I hope that answers your question, Keon. Great question for, for a 10 year old from New York City. I love it. Um, that is sublimation. It's just, uh, it's what happens instead of melting when there's no air pressure, you go straight to a gas. And that is just sublime. <laughs> we say that it sublimes. Um, I made a pun. Some of you might have gotten my pun because when something is fantastic and wonderful and just makes us go, oh my God, we say that it's sublime. Like I might say if I saw a sunset and the beautiful colors, I might say, wow, that sunset is just sublime. So it's that word sublime. It means to go from a solid straight to a gas. Do not stop at liquid. But it also means just beautiful, wonderful, fills me with awe. That also is a meaning for that, that word, sublime. Kira, 23-year-old in Maine, wants to know if dry ice is sublimation. Yes. Yes, Kira. Um, Kyra? Kira. Um, 
A good example. Yes. So dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. It's, you know, that same, it's just, you know, carbon dioxide, the stuff that is in the air and we worry about there being too much of it because we talked about, uh, because it absorbs infrared radiation and so it blocks, it keeps the earth from cooling off. That same stuff, that's carbon dioxide as a gas. If you freeze it, you make solid carbon dioxide. That is dry ice. And yes, when you, when you heat up dry ice at the conditions of the surface of the earth, it goes straight to a gas. Welcome to my laboratory. And that is sublimation. Now, it's what's cool though, Kira, is that you can make liquid carbon dioxide if you have enough pressure a lot more pressure than you have on Earth. Like, let's say if you had as much pressure as you have on Venus, like a hundred times the pressure on Earth, then if you had solid carbon dioxide and you heated it up, you actually can make liquid carbon dioxide and you can melt it, but not on Earth. On the surface of the Earth, carbon dioxide, there's not enough air pressure and carbon dioxide will go straight to a gas. And that is sublimation. So yeah, dry ice is, is a good example of that. Thank you. I thought I would take a little uh, moment for a little uh, musical interlude, which I like to do, sort of break up the, uh, the funky science story hour with a little bit of funk. It's like, like a lot of you, I can't really go anywhere right now. We're kind of mostly stuck at home for a while, waiting for this, uh, this illness to, uh, to run its course. And um, so we're noticing a lot of things close to home. And one thing, one thing we're really noticing a lot is all the birds here in the city in Washington D.C. and the birds in our yard. And they're these, um, they're these uh, cardinals, a male and female cardinal, and um, and the male is always feeding the female um, cardinal, feeding her worms and stuff, and she's getting kind of plump. <laughs> Anyways, um, so uh, so that made me think of uh, this this song, which um, prob probably a lot of you know, and if you do, you can sing along. This is by the great Bob Marley.
right. Thank you for indulging that. Inspired by the birds in our backyard. And I hope that wherever you are, you've got a window you can look out of and see something growing and maybe even some birds tweeting. Now, oh, Stacy, thank you. Thank you for singing along with me. I can hear you. I can hear you all the way here in Washington, D.C. Now, I had a couple of questions, um, a couple of kind of funky questions that came in. Let me just pull them up here. Um, oh, ha, this is a good one. Lauren, seven years old from Maine, and other inquiring minds want to know, what is the red thing that looks like a red pepper on the top of your Facebook page? In fact, what is the whole thing? Lauren from Maine and other inquiring minds want to know. Okay. What is that red thing that looks like a pepper on top of my Facebook page? Well, this is kind of weird, all right? I fully admit. I'm weird, okay? I know that. Some of you are weird, too. <laughs> I can see that. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, to me, that's sort of a positive thing. Like, um, you know, why, why do I need to be like everybody else and so so i'm kind of goofing around a little bit with that that um that artwork on top of my facebook page but let me explain it to you because it's a little bit of a joke so recently we had uh the anniversary of the hubble space telescope and we call that sometimes the hst and the hubble space telescope is really in a way the most amazing scientific instrument ever built by human beings, or it's one of them. It's right, right up there. Yeah, weirdness is fun. I agree, Bonnie. Um, it's one of it's one of the most amazing things humans have ever done. Now, there's a, humans have done a lot of amazing things. Okay, I don't want to be an astronomical snob and say astronomy is the greatest thing there is, but it's it's pretty good, right? <laughs> and um, and the Hubble Space Telescope is um, the it's a telescope that's in orbit around the Earth. Um, a big telescope up in space orbiting the Earth. And what's amazing about that is it lets us see the universe, the rest of the universe, so much more clearly than we could see looking even from the best telescopes uh, on the highest mountains on Earth because when you're looking up from a telescope on the surface of the Earth, the reason why, by the way, do you ever think about why do we put telescopes on mountaintops? Why don't you just put them... Um, you know, in the middle of the city where you could get to them more easily or something. Well, uh, I mean, two reasons. You don't want to be in a city because of all the light pollution, right? Um, you want to have a really dark place so you can see all the light coming from space. But also, you the reason why you're up on a mountaintop is because you're out of a lot of, you're, you're not looking through as much of the atmosphere of the Earth. Because the atmosphere, we talked about how, um, remember when we talked about why is the sky blue and we talked about how the atmosphere itself scatters light, the molecules in the atmosphere scatter light? Well, if you're looking through a telescope at a distant galaxy or a distant star or something really far in space, you want to get as much light as possible. You don't want any of that light scattered and blurred out by the atmosphere. So the higher you go on a mountaintop, the more you're above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere, and not just the air, but the clouds and the water vapor and everything in that atmosphere that might be blocking your view. So the higher the mountaintop, the better place to put a telescope. But even on the highest mountaintop on Earth, you're still looking through a lot of atmosphere and you're still getting scattered light and it's going to blur out the pictures. So imagine how, imagine how good you're telescope would be, the images you got from the telescope, the pictures and the information, imagine how good it would be if you could take it all the way out of the atmosphere and put it up in outer space. Well, that's what we did with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's a telescope in orbit and it can see the universe so clearly because it's out of the atmosphere. So recently we had a, a big anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope and people were celebrating that and it's called, for short, we call the Hubble Space Telescope HST, the HST. Okay, so the joke was there's also there's a famous writer who um, who died a few years ago, um, but he was a favorite writer of mine and a lot of 
my friends and our friends and your parents probably know about him if you don't. And his name was Hunter Thompson or Hunter S. Thompson. And he signed things HST, or people called him for short, called him HST. And he was a really famous writer, and he was funny and smart, and he um, also just kind of weird and, and, and interesting writer. And he would uh, describe um, like politicians in sort of a funny way, and 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 um, helped us to helped us to kind of like see what was going on in the world. So he was a really famous guy, and it was also HST. So when we had all these anniversaries for the Hubble Space Telescope and all, everybody was saying, oh, the HST is this and that, I was thinking, oh, well, yeah, HST also is Hunter, Hunter S. Thompson. So that was why I made that weird artwork. So that thing on the, the thing on, the, uh, on my thing that lo looks like a pepper, it's actually, it was his symbol. His symbol was a fist with two thumbs, a fist with two thumbs that is holding a peyote button. Now, what is a peyote button? Hmm. It's hard to describe. It has something to do with lava lamps. I'm not going to tell you what a peyote button is right now. I'm going to let your parents, you can ask them. Well, I'll just tell you. Okay. A peyote button is, is something, it's, uh, don't try this at home, but it's, a, it's really, it's a kind of, um, well, it's almost like a kind of drug. It's something that if you, if you eat it, it will make you hallucinate and um, have all kinds of crazy visions and stuff. And some um, some indigenous, some native people had uh, used it as part of their religion. Um, anyways, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about peyote. Ask your parents if you want. But anyways, this guy, Hunter Thompson, HST, he had as his symbol uh, a, a fist with two thumbs holding a peyote button. And at his funeral, get this, I told you he was kind of a weird guy. At his funeral, there was a big rocket ship a big rocket ship with that symbol of the two, the fist with two thumbs and the peyote button on top and his ashes at his funeral, his memorial, his ashes got launched off over the mountains from that rocket with the fist and the peyote buttons. And that picture, that thing that looks like a red pepper is actually the rocket holding his ashes from his memorial service. But the rest of that picture on the left there is actually the Hubble Space Telescope getting launched into space from the space shuttle. When we put the Hubble Space Telescope into orbit, it was launched from the space space shuttle. And so on my artwork that you asked about, that's the Hubble Space Telescope being launched into space. And that thing in the middle is the rocket with Hunter S. Thompson's HST's ashes with the peyote button and the two, the fist with the two thumbs. And then over on the right side, there's a picture of a beautiful nebula, which is a, uh, something that it's a picture taken with the Hubble Space Telescope of a nebula, which is a, a cloud of gas glowing in space way out in the galaxy. And it's glowing because it's, it's got all these, this dust and this gas that is being illuminated by nearby stars. And it's, it's a place where baby stars are going to be born from the collapse of that nebula, of that cloud of gas. So it's a beautiful image. And then inside the image, you might notice a guy's face that I put there. And that face is Hunter S. Thompson. So it's an HST image from the Hubble Space Telescope with the face of HST, Hunter S. Thompson. Okay, that's probably a too long a story about that. But you, you asked, there's your answer. <laughs> this is from um, Laura, who's 55. Uh, we're all kids here, right, Laura? And Laura asked, if you could see only in the gamma wavelength, what would we see? Oh, that's such a cool question. Now, let me explain what she means by seeing only in the gamma wavelength. Okay, so... We talked before about different colors of light and how they're the spectrum and how they're uh, different wavelengths of light. And the red light is longer wavelengths. And the and then it goes red, orange, yellow. And, and then when, the, when you get to blue, it's shorter wavelengths. And violet, it's even shorter. And then if you get longer than red, so you can't see it anymore, what's that called? Infrared, right? It's red, the, the light that's redder than red is infrared. And if you get shorter than blue or violet, shorter wavelength, so you can't see it anymore, what's that called? It's called ultraviolet. 
okay? But what's cool is that there are more kinds of radiation than just that. The visible light that you can see, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, is a tiny part of a much larger spectrum. It's the part you can see. So you go out beyond infrared and you get to other wavelengths we haven't really talked about yet, but you've heard about things like microwaves and radio waves, and it keeps going. And on the other side, if you get to shorter wavelengths than blue and violet, you get to ultraviolet, but then it keeps going. And you get to things called x-rays, which you've heard about, right? Because x-rays is when you go to the dentist or, or the doctor and you have to get an x-ray taken. That's radiation that can go right through your body and see your bones because the shorter wavelengths are also more energetic and it goes right through matter. That's x-rays. Well, if you go even farther than x-rays, blue, ultraviolet, blue, violet, ultraviolet x-ray, and you keep going, then you get to something called gamma rays, which are really, really short wavelengths and really energetic. Gamma rays, that's the most energetic radiation in the universe. And gamma rays are things that, or that it's very extreme events that make gamma rays. It's like when, um, uh, when stars explode, you know, at the end of a, we haven't really talked about this. They're going to do it in a future funky science story hour, but stars have a life cycle. We talked a little bit about the birth of stars from a collapsing cloud of gas and then stars go through their life and different things happen. Well, certain kinds of stars, when they get to the end of their life, they die in very violent explosions that we call supernovas. And when a star has one of those supernova explosions, it puts out lots of radiation, including gamma rays. So we see supernovas and there are other things in the universe that put out gamma rays. So if you could see in gamma rays and you looked up at the sky, you wouldn't see necessarily all the stars and planets that we normally see because they're not always putting out very many gamma rays. But what you would see is you'd see the exploding stars and you'd see flashing their things called pulsars, which are these tiny little stars called neutron stars that are whizzing around going out in space and they flash gamma rays. And then there are these other really weird things that we call gamma ray bursts, which are the most energetic explosions in the universe. And they happen when something like two stars collide or a star gets sucked into a black hole or something really violent. And when a gamma ray burst happens, it's so energetic that for a brief instant of time, you know, sometimes just some milliseconds, which a millisecond is a thousandth of a second, really, really short burst. They can be so bright, it can be brighter than an entire galaxy, just for a brief, brief burst. So if you could look up at the sky and see in gamma rays, then you would see all the exploding stars and you'd see all the spinning pulsars and you'd occasionally see these gamma ray bursts from far away in the universe when stars collide. So that would be pretty cool, um, something to aspire towards. Now, coming to the end of this funky science story hour, but I'm going to do one more because this is a fun, kind of a weird question, and I like it. Um, uh, this is from Amy Flockton. Hi, Amy. And she said, 12-year-old here wanted to know, oh, this is cool. 12 year old here wanted to know if people with mental illness suffer more at the full moon and if creatives become more creative at the full moon. That's a really interesting question. Uh, how does the phase of the moon affect humans and does it affect us at all and why should it? Uh, first of all, you all know, um, why the moon looks full sometimes and why it looks like a crescent sometimes, right? It has to do, uh, let me let me just do this real quick. Let me get a planet, because this is kind of fun. Um, turn off one of these lights so we have something like a, more of a point source. Whoa, don't knock over the lava lamp, Dr. Funky. Um, let me turn off the lava lamp so we have more of a point source here. It's not that much of a point source, is it? No, it sort of is. Um, okay, so anyways, that's the sun. The light source is the sun. I'm looking from the Earth. 
So if I'm looking over here away from the sun, then I'm seeing a full moon, right? And if, and, and once a month, or once every 28 days, 28 and a half days or so, the moon goes around the earth. So when it's here, when, I, when I'm looking mostly at the sun, and I'm just, oh, I'm seeing this backwards. You can see now there's, I'm looking partly at the bright side, <laughs> partly at the bright side and partly at the dark side of the moon. So I'm seeing more of a crescent, right? And then if it's, um, let's see if I can do this. Then I'm seeing a crescent and I'm seeing a crescent on the other side. I could set this up better next time to really show the phases of the moon. But you get the idea that as the moon orbits the earth once a month, once every 28 and a half days, when it's on the side of the earth away from the sun, so you're seeing the whole thing fully illuminated, then you get a full moon. Unless it goes right behind the earth and then you get an eclipse. But we'll talk about that another time. Okay, but anyways, so the point of this for your question of how the full moon affects human behavior is there's nothing really changing about the moon, right? Uh, it's the same size, uh, the angle's different, but you know, why should it affect human behavior? Now, there's a lot of stories about the moon affecting human behavior, and there have been reports that say there's more crime when there's a full moon or more incidents of mental illness on a full moon or uh you know other things but then there have been people that have studied those reports scientifically and they say you know what that's not really true if you really look at uh at crime statistics and so forth you can't really uh there are people that that have tried to study it and said no it's not true it doesn't really do anything so my personal opinion is that I'm not sure about it. I think those are the hardest kinds of things for science to study is subtle correlations of human behavior. Um, it's, you know, it's, humans are complex. They're not like molecules. They're not simple in their behavior. And they respond in a lot of way to a lot of different things. And there's all kinds of other factors in the culture um, and the way we interact with each other and the way people are different in different places. So I think humans are one of the hardest things to study with science. So I, honestly, I'm not sure about that. There are some weird correlations. I mean, well, the first thing I'll say is that there are other animals, and humans, of course, are animals. There are other animals that clearly have behavioral cycles that uh, are linked to the, the phase of the moon. You know, like there are kinds of fish that mate under the full moonlight and only mate under the full moonlight. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of animal behavior that changes under the full moon. And if you think of it, it makes sort of makes sense that humans should behave differently under a full moon um, because uh, because it's light out at night. I mean, it would not surprise me if there were more crimes committed. Uh, you know, people are going to be out and about and you could see more. So, you know, I'm going to say I don't know and I don't think anybody completely knows about that. You can find... Uh, scientific studies where people claim that and then claim the opposite. So I don't know. And the, another weird thing is that there is a human biological cycle that seems linked to the lunar cycle, and that is the, the, the human female menstrual cycle. When women get their periods, the average length of time is almost exactly the same as the, uh, the length of a lunar cycle. It's 28 and a half days on average. Now, maybe that's just a complete coincidence. I mean, it could be, but it also could have something to do with evolution and behavior and ritual. And, you know, who knows? I'm going to say it's a really interesting question um, and that uh, we don't know the answer. I'm going to turn back on the lava lamp back on for this one, but I think we're drawing to the end, the close of another fun-filled and funky, funky science story hour. But thank you so much for, for tuning in. It's always fun to spend time with you guys in this way and get your questions and your comments. Keep the questions coming in for next week. And uh, as always, we'll take it out with the funky science story hour theme song.
All right. Peace, love, science, and happiness. I'll see you next week.